We're very glad that uh, we've had this meeting today and, and uh, heard testimonies and uh, enjoy one another's faith and one another's blessings from the Heavenly Father. Um, we're uh, recording because we do put it on on the um, YouTube and, and on the website and so on. Um, hopefully, I've only got one sheet of paper today. <laughs> Uh, I uh, hadn't planned on making it too long, but you know, when you the longer you work on it, the more verses you think of. <laughs> and uh, so, um, anyway, I, I want to uh, give you a good sermon, not too lengthy, hopefully. And I know lunch is waiting. <laughs> so, uh, but this has been good to be here. I was glad when they said unto me that I could go into the house of the Lord. Yes, oh yes, Lord's blessings. So today is uh, t entitled, Christ's Love for the Church. Uh, amazing things that uh, we can read about and enjoy. Um, uh, I found some in here that I'm, I'm going to leave out because I deliberately wrote myself a note. Hosea's verse not correct. So if you want to read the book of Hosea, it's pretty short. And try to find something about this church at the same time, about a church or about the church of God. Uh, Church of Christ, um, that would be interesting for you to read a little book like that and say, where did he, what did he leave out? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that would be good. So let's start today's uh, sermon, though, on Ephesians 5. I'll come back to this later, so I'll try not to add in things uh, that are too lengthy, but uh, we do want to, uh, just a second here, Ephesians I'm using these little glasses because it helps at the short range. And uh, there we go. Uh, it helps on short range, and my eyes are not finished healing yet. And then they're going to talk about glasses, but really just reader glasses, because close range and far range is supposed to be okay. It's in between where the problem is. So, uh, yes, we're very uh, glad for the progress that uh, I've been able to receive for my eyes. Uh, at home, I'm slightly closer. So if I have to wiggle back and forth, you'll know why. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, 26, and 27. 25, 26, and 27. Husbands, love your wives. Oh, that's a commandment of the New Testament. Isn't that interesting? Just like that, right out of the blue, it grabs you and says, hey, God just gave a commandment for us in the New Testament. <laughs> okay. Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. When we start evaluating our homes and evaluating the church and how we love the brotherhood and how much Christ loves the brotherhood and Christ loves the church, the individual people, and the buildings and everything about it, um, we all of a sudden need to kind of wake up and say, wow, Christ is really in this and all about it. We need to be talking about Christ. So we go down um, uh, uh, next verse, verse 26, that he might sanctify the, and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Washing of water by the word. So the holy scriptures are going to do something for us. We heard that today, right? We heard that in a testimony. Wow, okay. So he's going to uh, wash us through the word. Verse 27. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it, might, that it should be holy without blemish. You know, the first time I heard that, 70 years ago, I was a young boy in church. This was the kind of verses that was read to us and talked to us, taught us, that we needed to be those kind of people. Yeah, we, we were being evaluated. We were, God was looking over us. God was wanting to fix us. Heavenly Father wanted to be very much involved in our lives, uh, that we would be cleansed, turned to Christ, accept Christ as our Savior, 
that would we consider our who we are and how we behave ourselves. Before I was baptized, and I know I heard it many times after I was baptized, but 10 years old I was baptized. I knew what I was doing too. I'd seen enough sin. I knew what sin was. I didn't want any part of it. Because it's all about Christ. It's all about the Heavenly Father that we will be a glorious church, a church of Christ, a church that's going to do Christ's things, spread the gospel to the world. Yeah, I, I knew about that. We needed to go out and witness and testify and win them, tell them about Christ, bring them to Christ. Wow. It's right, it's right there, all in one verse. And what about me? Not having a spot or a wrinkle. I remember mother ironing the clothes. I knew about wrinkles. I knew about spots being in there and you had to wash them twice or something. I knew what this was all about. I had a visual. And God doesn't want those spots. He doesn't want the wrinkles. He wants to fix them. That we might be a glorious church, a holy church, for, for the glory and honor of the Heavenly Father and for His Son, Jesus Christ. Okay, let's keep going. So the Heavenly Father is loving us and helping our direction of travel and fixing us and so on. And Christ is helping us. And we're going to get to the Holy Spirit in a little while. <laughs> There's lots of verses about what the Holy Spirit can do for us and with us and should be our, our goal as well. The church is polluted. You start looking at what's going on around us Think, oh my, and they call themselves Christians. They call themselves a church that belongs to the Heavenly Father, a church person that belongs to Jesus Christ. And what's going on in the church? Well, I could read all those verses to you. Second Timothy chapter three, one to five. Oh boy. Would you really like me to stay there a little bit and read that to you, or do you think you can remember that and read it at home? That's what reality is. What about 1 Timothy chapter 3? Same location there. But now go to the 12th to 17th verse. Oh boy. This is reality. This is what's going on in our world. Well, in his too, right? The writer of this? It was happening in his world. Did Satan give up and things all of a sudden get really good? No. We got the same problems today that they had when he was writing this. What kind of people were at the church? What kind of people asked to be involved in certain things coming to the church? It's so bad now, you almost have to have an insurance just in case somebody claims something while they're at church. You, know, you want to have a child's class? You've got to have two accesses to it, and you've got to have windows in the doors, and you got all kinds of things because of the terrible world that we're in. Yeah, it's a polluted church. We got something to do. We got a, work, a job to do. But we know that God loves us. And I put in here the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. I had to make them a little bigger because I write in all caps anyway. <laughs> uh, our Heavenly Father loves us with an everlasting love. He's not going to give up on us. Sometimes when I talk about if you put yourself in God's hand, He won't drop you. You won't fall out of there. It's your job to stay in the hat, you know, stay in the hand, stay in God's hands, stay in His will. In, uh, that's in Jeremiah 31, verse 3 as well. But God's eternal or everlasting love. So that's one. If you want to write down some of these, you can write them down. Jeremiah 31, and verse 3, the love that God has for us. It's an active love. It's an operational love. And that's in Galatians 1, verse 4. Let's just look that one up because I'm here easy, cl close to it. Galatians 1 and verse 4. This is talking about Christ in the verse above. It says, Our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for 
our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. The world is evil, very bad, despicable, but he's saving us from it. We can handle that. That'd be really nice to be out of the mess. Well, we won't be really out of it until the trumpet blows and the comedy I heard about kids where the guy blows his whistle or his fingers or something. Everybody out of the pool. When that happens, there won't be any more going back and say, oh, I wish I'd done better. I wish I'd fixed it. I wish I'd prayed more times. I wish I'd read the Bible more times. Yeah, there won't be any going back. We need to be ready to meet our Maker. Amen. Ready. Then He's trying to deliver us out of it. And if we don't take the bait, don't take the job, don't do what we should be doing, we know better. Especially if we read the Bible, we know better. We need to get ourselves out of there. Some people get in trouble with that verse that says, save yourself from this untoward world, uh, generation. Um, you know, verses like that. Save yourself. Ah, it's this guy that I got to look out for. Get yourself out of that trouble. Don't stay in there. Don't get involved in there. Just get out of it. That kind of save yourself. Okay, uh, I'm going to follow along um, on the top of a few of these things. What's verse 6 have to say here? Yeah, Galatians 1 verse 6. And actually, yeah, I read all of this so well over and over. I said, how much could I leave out or should I not leave out? Uh, God figured that one out. <laughs> okay. So if I could demand of you, ask of you politely, that this chapter and, a, and, a, and one verse... Galatians chapter 1, all of the chapter, and verse 1 of chapter 2. This is downright everything that we need to be doing and getting on with it. Um, verse 6, for instance, marvel, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto grace and, uh, of Christ unto another gospel. Uh, that sounds interesting when you read through and it just kind of goes quickly. But what we were discussing in church meetings and talking with people on the phone and so on about this other gospel, people come along and say, well, you need to add this on to your teachings. You need to add that on to your teaching. Um, no. We want what Christ wants. We want what God wants. It's not so difficult. Like I tell people, you know, when Jesus was giving out the orders, he said, go into all the world and teach them Hebrew first. No, he didn't. Or he went to all the world and tell them that they have to go to Jerusalem four times a year, three times a year, or uh, at least once a year for the feast days. And, and you get tangled up in feasts. You get tangled up in words and Hebrew phrases and free, Hebrew this and Hebrew that. You get all, this is supposed to be a simple gospel that goes to all the world. How many languages? It used to be 150 countries. I know there's more than that now. Dialects? Is there 3,000 dialects? I think that's what I've heard. You're going to teach all of those people how to read Hebrew first. And then you're going to tell them about, about Jesus Christ? Somebody is deceiving us. They're filling us, our lives with all of this overwhelming stuff that you'll never get there. You, you can't handle this. It's impossible for you. So why don't you just give up while you're ahead? That's wrong thinking. It's a simple gospel. It's free, easy to meet Jesus Christ in your own language. Yep, it's not hard. You read in the Old Testament where God said, I'm going to send you to a country where, you'll, where they'll have hard languages. You won't know their speech. Then other places probably in the New Testament, I'm going to send you to places where you won't have any hard languages. Why? Because all the world had to know uh, Gal... What's the word? Uh, well, I can't get it. Kind of, uh, the um, languages of, of the Chaldean, Chaldean language, because they ruled the world. So you do any business, you had to know their language. Then along came the Greeks... And you had to learn their language if you're going to do anything at all in the whole thing. 
God provided. Of course, he's got the Hebrew Bible and got it translated into Greek so that the whole world could get it, right? He made it easy for them. Then along came the Romans. And he had to learn Latin before he could preach. But you know what? They already knew Greek. So the Bible got written in Greek. The preaching was in Greek. The Bible they used was a Greek Bible from the Septuagint, you know, from Hebrew into Greek. They had it pretty easy. But nowadays they want to say, well, I, you know, I got a better way for you. First learn all you can about Hebrew, and then, then you go and teach these people Hebrew, all of their speech and all their language, and then you go back and, no, I don't know. Do you see what the world is doing to us? They're trying to mess us up. Satan is trying to confuse us as to what's important. It's an easy gospel in our own language. Anyway, it starts at verse 6, really, when it starts getting interesting. and uh, This teaching that somebody's trying to put over on you is not another gospel in verse 7. Um, don't let them get away with it. They're just troubling you in verse 7. And they're preventing the gospel of Christ, trying to delay, postpone, run it off the rails. Um, and then he says, even if an angel came and told you, he came, said, I came from heaven and uh, I've got this other teaching that I'm going to lay on you and you'll be better because I, I got here and I'm giving it to you. You mean to say from year 33 all the way till 1933, this gospel was never preached? Some have actually said that. Big organizations have said that the gospel was missing from year 33 all the way to 1933. They preached that. They wrote it in their magazines. Even a problem, they kept Sabbath. You've got to be on your toes. The, the bad things are going to happen inside our organizations, inside of our meeting areas. People are going to come up with strange teachings because they're trying to derail the true teachings. Delay. You know, that's a big thing. Delay things. They pervert the gospel of Christ in verse 7 there. Uh, so don't let anybody get in your way if they're teaching other than these teachings that are here in the scriptures. Um, uh, do you, for do I now persuade men of God? Uh, are we supposed to persuade somebody about God, or is God real and has always been there and we need to start preaching it? We don't have to persuade somebody into that there's an everlasting God. He's made it all. It's already going. It's already operating. We don't have to debate that again, do we? Well, in Sabbath school we did because you need the <laughs> we need background in order to talk to people that say things that are not, not correct. But he's, it's a question mark. Do you want me to try to start persuading men when it's already real, you might say? Uh, do I speak to please men? Question mark. No. We didn't teach the gospel as it is. Preach it from the scriptures. For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Who's first in your life? Wow. Okay, I love that question mark too. I certify you, brethren. I'm getting you your names. You're going to tell me that you agree. You're going to show a hand or whatever. He's going to certify. Is this real? What he's telling. That the gospel which was preached of me is not after men. He's preaching something that he didn't get from some man and carry over to give to another man that gave it to him there in that other country. So I want you to be proof, have proof of that and understand that. Yeah. Why do we need the next chapter, next half chapter? Because <laughs> he's going to verify where he went, what he did. He had talked with Christ. Jesus gave him the message that Paul carried. He didn't have to go down to Jerusalem and learn it from Paul and so on. Uh, not Paul, uh, Peter. He didn't have to learn it from Peter. He didn't have to learn it from... So he mentions James, but just sort of in passing. He went there to study with Peter, to hear Peter's input and to 
give his input that he knew, already knew and things that God had done, Christ had done for him and so on. They were, they were back and forth, friendly, helping one another. Oh, and by the way, I saw James while I was there. Because that's going to be important as to who he saw when he went. He didn't go down there and gather up 10 volumes and memorize whatever was given to him and then go back and teach what somebody else taught. Interesting. Yeah, we're right here in Corinthians, in Galatians. He got his message from Christ, and he's writing these messages to the church. Uh, so when you'd go all the way down to where he traveled, what he did, and so on, um, that's in verse 19, he said, I hadn't seen the other apostles. Um, I saw none. Oh, save one. Okay, <laughs> I love the scriptures. <laughs> so save one. He saved James, uh, the brother of, uh, the Lord's brother. This book, blow, that, that one verse can blow people clear out of the water. Because some teach that Jesus never had any brothers. Because Mary didn't have any more children before or after Jesus' birth. That she was a virgin beforehand. She was a virgin all the way to her death. And now, wait a minute. What do they do with this verse? That's only half a verse. People destroy the scriptures. They try to follow you up with every possibility. And yet it's right there. Mine's in red. <laughs> I marked it, underlined it. Okay. So we need to catch on to these things. It's very easy to learn and understand and to know what's going on. When they came to Jesus, when he was visiting with others, talking with others, in quite a group, it was crowded. And along came Mary and his brother's family, came to the door and he said, your brothers and sisters, your family out here, your brotherhood is out here. And he said, who's my brotherhood? These that were in front of him, hearing his word, he says, they are my brothers. Now that wasn't slandering his mother and his family. He was putting a priority on what's going on. Would he stop what was going on? His preaching, his message, would he stop that and take care of his family? Not at the moment. Jesus loved his family. He always loved his mother. He said, mother, here's the fellow that's going to take care of you. John, this is your mother now because I can't be here. He cared for his mother and his family. Wow, okay. So anyway, he uh, had gone down there about seven years. What verse is that in now? If I can find it. Three years. Verse 18. After three years, I went up to Jerusalem. Oh, he forgot the priest day, the, the, the uh, feast days. He forgot the feast day. No, he did not. It was not supposed to be kept. Why would you keep a feast day when there's no feast? You can't do animal sacrifice. The temple is closed. The, the veil is torn away. The whole Shekinah glory of God it's gone. It's left the room. That couldn't be done. So why would he go up there to, to celebrate three times a year? It was compulsory. No matter where you lived, three times a year, you'd have to go to Jerusalem. That doesn't work very well when you take the whole message to the whole world. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to tell you, you've got, you got to have enough money income that you can travel three times a year to Jerusalem. That wasn't part of the deal. It's a soft message. Turn your life over to Christ. Live godly. Get right with all of your things. It wasn't about where you go and, and how many animals you can haul with you or can't haul with you. Do you have enough money to buy animals when you, when you get to Jerusalem? It's, it's not about that. It's about your relationship with Jesus Christ, your Savior. Okay, so that was three years that he didn't have to go. Maybe he was there one time or whatever. It doesn't even mention it. But what is chapter 2, verse 1? Then 14 years after, I went up to Jerusalem with uh, Barnabas and, and took t Titus with me. 14 years in between, when he went up again, that's noteworthy to write it into the book. 14 years. No going to the feast days three times a year. It's right there in our messages, right there in the Gospels. We don't need somebody to come along one day and say, you're not keeping your, your uh, 
service to God correctly. I've had them sit right here in that room and tell me that they've come to teach me that I'm going to have to change my ways because now I need to be teaching Hebrew. I need to be teaching this other thing and this here and this here and this custom and tradition. All has to be taught. And they're going to show me how to do it. (sighs) Wow. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Okay. Um, Carrying on here. Uh, yes, it talks about uh, God in uh, John 17. Turn with me to John 17. I'm trying to uh, leave out just a few things, but not miss too much neither. John 17. And... Uh, it is 26 26 and I have declared unto them thy name this is Jesus talking to his heavenly father so maybe we should back up a verse Um, thou lovest me before uh, before the foundation of the world when did Jesus come into existence when he was a baby born in a manger Whoa! Some people teach that and they'd like us to teach it. He was there before the world was formed when God said, let us make man in our image. Wow! People are so far off. Um, Anyway, we need to teach the truth. This is in Jesus' words, red letters. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, the world that should have been Christ-like, Christian-like, Hebrew-like, they didn't know the Heavenly Father. But I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Interesting there too. One God cannot send another God. In fact, there's only one God, right? That's what we studied this morning in Sabbath school. There is only one God. There is no two gods. Somebody else did not send Jesus other than somebody higher in power and authority than him. Because you cannot send somebody that that you don't have authority over. Interesting. It's right there. Half a dozen words. Okay, then 26. And I have declared them, declared unto them thy name, and will declare, it's that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Jesus wants to be in those people called the church. They're in them already. That's what he's saying. I want them to be in there. And I want you, Heavenly Father, to be in them as well. That's that's not two people. That's people working in harmony. Wow. Interesting. Very interesting how much Christ loves the church and gave his life for it. John 13, verse 1. Just a couple of pages back. John 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour was come and that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Two people. Not one. If God died on the cross... Who is ruling the world? The logic is impossible. Christ was the Son of God. He died on the cross for our sins. The Heavenly Father was watching over this and brought Jesus back to life. You know, we can think of our our faith. If I die, God will get me from wherever I am. If I die in the ocean or if I die in a car wreck or in a house fire, uh, God's going to get me back. The Heavenly Father is going to get... Jesus had to feel that as well when he was dying on the cross. Wow. Okay, can I trust my Heavenly Father that he's going to fetch me out of this? Is there a second choice? (laughs) There isn't one. He had to stand on that same faith that you and I stand on. No matter how we die, are we going to meet the Heavenly Father in good terms? We better get it done now. Get it right. 
at present. Because Jesus had to depart out of the world, this living space, this mess that's here that man has made. Uh, he needed to depart out of here unto the Father, two people there. Uh, having loved his own, Jesus loved the disciples and the, the believers that were around him, which were in the world, and he loved them unto the end. So Christ loved people unto the end, and the Heavenly Father as well. Okay, um, evidence of this love. Maybe I can go kind of short on this as well. First uh, Thessalonians chapter 3, 1 to 13, it says, that, he, that Christ is ext- establishing a church that's unblameable and perfect. So if you want to hunt that up sometime, 3-3 three, three there. Second um, Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. Then another one. Uh, he brings the church into a state of union with himself. He's building this church the way he wants it built. He's wanting to make it work, make it... Uh, a happy situation, even for himself. Um, I'll take a try at that one. First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter six. I put the little papers in there so that I can go faster. <laughs> um, well, that was next verse. Let's go back here to chapter 6. There's chapter 6. Chapter 6 and verse 15. Verse 15 is right there. Know ye not that our bodies are the members of Christ. Wow, members of Christ. Don't we, don't we know that? Don't you understand that you belong to Christ? Yeah. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forget. God forbid. Harlot is a church that has gone wayward. They're playing games here. They're playing games there. They're playing games there with people's lives with righteousness, with holiness, with, um, they call it a harlot, because they're harlot churches. Remember in the book of Revelations, the harlot churches? Okay. People are playing games with them, getting involved with them, and that's not a good idea. They need to get out of that. Uh, Then I want to read 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, from God, and of God, and ye are not your own, not your own. Wow. Don't spoil it is what he's getting at here, right? Don't spoil it. You're, you're, you're a loved you're, and a taken care of person. Uh, don't spoil anything there because your body is even the temple, a church location, a spiritual location for the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. Wow. This is not just 50 cents or a a discount store or this is a big wealthy place that you got bought from there. You are no longer a slave to this other person earning money for them. He's bought your slave ship away. He's saved you, bought you out of that. You belong to Jesus Christ. Wow. And these people knew about slaves. Yeah, they knew about a lot of slavery. Wherefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, which are the Heavenly Father's belongings. That's what it means. This already belongs to the Heavenly Father. Yes, that's a special blessing for us. Uh, there's 15. Um, the Holy Spirit and Christ uh, is going to mobilize, uh, and Jesus is going to mobilize the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, you have to read those verses about the Holy Spirit where it says that 
the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say when you're in this in this situation. Uh, when you're studying, the Holy Spirit is going to give you the knowledge. And look up those kind of verses and realize how connected you are with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is going to send the Holy Spirit to us. He did when he when he left. He said, "If I go, then I can't. If I don't go, I can't send the Holy Spirit. But if I go, I can send the Holy Spirit, and He'll teach you all that you need to know." Right. That's where we need to be. Okay. Um, but we need to know the, the work of the Heavenly Father through the Bible, through God's Word, and um, let uh, God bless us and show us the way to go. Um, he performs the work through those He appoints. Sometimes you can just really tell that this person has been appointed to a certain position, a certain job, a certain activity, or a certain place where his uh, witness can reach other people where you can't go. Uh, I tell people, uh, I can't do prison ministries. I just can't do that. That's not me. I'm not an evangelist. Don't try to put me there. That's, that's not me. God will use the things that he's given me to use. So I've been appointed to this job. Do you remember Paul saying? Same things. He didn't try to challenge Peter. He said, Peter, you got a job to do down there with the Hebrew people. I've got the job up here with the, with the Gentiles. We're not challenging each other. We're, we just know our limits and our rules that God wants. I want you to look up with me with some verses on suffering because Christ will help us through the suffering and through the problems and, and we need to be ready for it. But this is really, really interesting. When you run across some, some verses, as you just say how did John 3.16 end up in 1 John 3.16? Almost. Well, here's one of these. Go with me to 2 Timothy. Here's a 2 Timothy. Okay. I got five papers in there because I knew there was different verses that were needed in there. So um, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Okay, that's back over here. Chapter 1. And I want to read verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. I have to suffer for Christ, suffer for the cause. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know, that's in chapter 12, chapter, pardon me, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. Did I, did I say something wrong? No, oh, I thought I heard somebody. Okay, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep those things which I have committed unto him against that day. I believe it, is what he's saying. I know this is true. Okay, and I'm not ashamed, he said. Even though he had to suffer, if he had to walk around with a chain on him, so what? People know who I am then, I guess. <laughs> uh, he didn't let it bother him. He wasn't ashamed of his chain. And there's times when he said that, just, just like that. Uh, okay, so that's a suffering in chapter 1, verse 12. Now go to chapter 2, verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. So what we're thinking here is suffering is an automatic problem. And yet we should be proud of it. Not, not, well, not lifted up with pride. But I'm not ashamed of being crucified or, or testified against or um, people say wrong things against me. You know, that's, that's what he's saying. If we're, if we're going to live righteously, we're going to have some suffering involved. Chapter 2, chapter, 2 Timothy, I should say, chapter 3, and verse 12. 3, 12. <laughs> 12, 12, 12. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We're going to suffer, aren't we? Oh, no, that's verse 13. 12, uh, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer 
persecution. And then we, because of the evil men and seducing spirits are around us, that's what's going to happen. We go out witnessing and telling them about Christ, presenting Christ to them, and uh, they won't like that. But if you're going to live godly, you will find persecution along the way. Don't let it bother you. God's still with you. What about Revelations chapter 2? Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. And one verse 10. Fear none of these things which shall that 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 thou shalt suffer. Behold the the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall be shall have tribulation ten days, and thou be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Let's take that apart a little bit. Don't suffer. Don't 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 be fearful of suffering. You know it's going to come. You know it's going to be around. People are going to scold. People are going to say nasty things, throw things at you maybe even. Who knows? The devil will cast some of you into prison. You're going to be tried. Don't worry about it. You shall have tribulation. Oh, we, we, we hate that word and we don't want to receive it. But you know, it'll go on for years and years and months and days and Oh, no, what does it say? Ten days. Hey, I can stand ten days, can't I? Jesus did 40 days and 40 nights. Moses did 40 days and 40 nights. You know, you can go down the list and say, yeah, we, we should be able to make it. Can you fast? How many days can you fast? Well, three is pretty tough. So how did they make it 40 days? We can do it. We're humans. We can do 40 days. We can do with God's help. But it's only asking for 10 days. Can't we stand our ground for 10 days? Whoa, yeah. I think this is what the church is all about, that we need to be able to stand those troubles and tribulations that come. Don't be distracted, distracted and moved off of the tracks. Uh, God is there for us. He's gracious to us by His estimation. We are valuable to the Heavenly Father and to Christ. We're valuable. They're going to look after us. Uh, we have this great connection with Christ and with the Heavenly Father. So then it says, uh, Christ's church is going to be glorious. Can we be part of that? We should be able to. No problem. Just ask for God's help. Ask for His holding us up and keeping us on the straight track. Without spot and wrinkle. Well, you know, it's not so funny. But we could do it, especially 10 days, you know, <laughs> uh, when the thick of it comes. We can stand up for a while. We can hold on. Or any such thing. Oh, that's the one that's worrisome. The being um, free from spots and wrinkles, but also going to be asked that we be faithful in all such things, to stay faithful um, that we should be holy without blemish. Those are tough words. We can only do it through having Christ in our lives, having the power of the Holy Spirit. We can make these things. And I was trained that way when I was 10 years old. That we could be faithful, we could be without blemish, without, uh, with holiness to be holy. So I pray I'm passing that on to you, that you'll feel that too, that the necessity of living righteous and living holy and representing the Heavenly Father correctly and representing Jesus Christ uh, correctly, that we might fully and faithfully serve. May God bless you.